Sandy did as someone who on the outside looks like she has the perfect life going on. She's surrounded by a great group of family and friends, is able to travel, lives in a beautiful home, and she even created an outreach that extends to the entire Houston Fire Department. What most people don't know is that after the sudden passing of her husband, Frank, Sandy endured the darkest time of her life. Her interview is a message of endurance, courage, faith, and hope, but none of these came easily. Sandy paid a high and incredibly painful price to survive her grief. But the bottom line is that when we fight to hang on, even if it's only by a thread of hope, we allow God the opportunity to work all things together for good, to give us beauty for ashes, and make us into exactly who he created us to be. Sandy, can you tell us, how did you meet Frank? I met him through um, a boss of mine that went to high school with him. And I had heard for several years about my friend Frank, my friend Frank. And um, one day she came to me and I wasn't in a particularly good spot. And she said, can I talk to you about my friend Frank? And I said, no, just don't talk to me about men. Well, anyway, she persevered, came back in a couple of weeks, and um, what ended up happening was he and I talked on the phone for six weeks, almost daily, and um, finally I said, are we ever going to meet? <laughs> and he said, well, you know, our mutual friend said, take it slow. And I'm thinking, how slow is slow? But what was so great about the six weeks is it gave me an opportunity to get to know him without looking at the outside and um, yes. judging him for this or that or him judging me. Um, that's how we met. Okay, so how long after you met him before you realized he was the one? Probably talking on the phone. I had never laid eyes on him, but I, I knew he was special. And we ended up going on two dates and we were together 20 years. Oh my goodness. What was his profession? He was a district chief safety officer for the Houston Fire Department. And you were married for 17 beautiful years until tragedy shook your world in 2013. Can you tell us about the night you lost Frank? He kissed me goodnight. I was in the living room and that was just our normal thing. And he went on to bed and I just remember being woken up by him about one something in the morning and he just said we gotta go and I heard him come into the living room and he would take his blood pressure you know over the bar and I heard that happening and I'm still you know coming out of a deep sleep he came back in I jumped out of bed went in the closet um, just to pull on whatever clothes were in there. And when I came back out, he was taking his last breaths. You know, when we deal with the death of a loved one, we often have this huge influx of people coming in to help us. They basically drop everything and come to our side and support us and love us, and, and they're there with us physically. But eventually, everybody goes back to their lives, and we kind of find ourselves looking at our life with this gaping hole in it from the loss of our loved ones. H how did you feel a few weeks after Frank passed? Um, I could not articulate my level of pain. And I'm a writer. Mm -hmm. I write poetry. And I could not describe it. Did you ever consider taking your life, Sandy? Yes. Did you have a plan? We, we can stop for a minute if you need to. Yes, I did. And yes, I had a plan. And what I can articulate, especially Today, looking back, is that that level of pain that you're experiencing, when it becomes all-consuming, people could say you may not be thinking clearly, 
your judgments clouded. And for the person who's in that much pain, you will do anything. And when I say anything, I want to underline anything to get out of that pain. And what I want to be crystal clear about is that I love my son, my stepdaughter, my family, mm -hmm. my friends, more than anything. The pain felt bigger than all of them combined. And I challenge anyone to understand that because they can't. And the people closest to me, I didn't want them to understand, if that makes sense, because then that would mean they'd be where I was. They had felt that level of pain, and you don't want people you love to experience something like that. No. When I've looked at suicide before, I've thought of it as something that's a very selfish act because that person is only considering themselves. But I don't think that that's the truth, and I don't think that's what you're saying. There's, there's a lot more to that. You're not, you're not thinking about yourself. You're just trying to get away from the pain. Is that what you would say? Yes, and that's why I'm saying to sit here and be able to tell my truth and where I was, mm -hmm. I would say that we need to do a lot less judging mm -hmm. of others and their definition. I think anybody that knows me would not describe me as a coward or selfish. We're sitting here today because a series of events happened that made it necessary to reveal my truth. And I am taking the risk of being judged because maybe somebody else, you know, would say, how could she do that? Or how could she even think that? Or what about our kids? Or what about our family? Or, and I just want to suggest to people to be empathetic, be kind, hear, what I'm saying about pain and the reason why people don't talk about their pain is because they don't feel safe enough to. Being safe is a very important word. Can you talk about that a little bit more? It's everything to me. Mm -hmm. And my closest friends know what that word means to me. And it's not so much safe with your physical being. Um, it's safe with your words. And what I mean by that is... I want to be a safe person for others. I want them to know that they can come to me, they can tell me anything, and it's not going to change my view of the person that I know and I love. Right. I just want to know I have that same grace with others. And I think that if you're a person who people know and recognize as being safe with, that that's a gift. And that's a gift that you can give to anybody you meet in your life. But you have to let them know that you are safe. And while you may have great friends, great family, there's still this tremendous amount of fear in being judged unfairly. You know, the, the tagline for the Christians in Crisis channel is finding light in the darkness. And... I believe the only way that we can ever find light in the darkness is when we bring the darkness out. I mean, the, the light will always overpower the darkness, but we have to be willing to be vulnerable and to open ourselves up and to share these things. And honestly, I would rather have somebody punch me in the face than to have them hurt me emotionally and to judge me and to criticize me. I mean, that, that's, such a, that's such a painful thing, and I don't know why. We just tend to, most people tend to do that. It's your, your default setting. Is you, you, you look at someone and you, you automatically go to that judgment place. And if we can just pause and step back and say, I have not walked in their shoes. I, I don't have the qualifications to judge them. I don't have the information. That's God's job. That's not my job. 
And speaking of God, I want to bring this up because I, I've done some research on it, Sandy, and people think, well, you know, Christians shouldn't do this. Or, it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or if you are not. You're subject to depression. You're subject to suicide. I mean, you're subject to all of these negative things, and nobody has an immunity against that. I've known people who were Christians who took their own lives. I haven't known personally pastors who have, but I know that there have been pastors who have. Depression is a very insidious and um, dangerous little demon that we don't want to talk about. We've got a broken arm. We go to the doctor because you can see that. That's so obvious, but when you've got a broken heart, why do we want to hide that and we want to act like we're okay? Because it's not going to heal. It's just like that broken arm, only that's a visible thing. That won't heal, but, but that broken heart, that's not going to heal either until you address it and take care of it. So I really want to thank you for being vulnerable and being brave and, and talking about this because this is something that everybody deals with. It's just not everybody has the ability or will allow themselves to talk about it. I remember that there was a time in the dark time where it was difficult for me to push air out and breathe air in. Like I go, am I, am I breathing? Because it felt like a particular weight every time I took a breath. I know that there was a point when you kind of hit a crossroads and you realized either you could travel down this road and become bitter and isolate yourself, or you could make the choice to go ahead and be the person that Frank fell in love with that he was so proud of. I said, well, you know, I, I, I remember not being mad at God, mm -hmm. and I wasn't mad at Frank because I believe that he, until his last breath, wanted to stay with me. Mm -hmm. But I didn't at the time, and for a long time, feel like the Sandy that he fell in love with. And I remember going to the therapist and I said, I just want to get back to the Sandy that, that Frank fell in love with. And he said, I'm sorry, you're never going to be her again. And he said, let's work with this one. So I want to talk about the work that you're doing now because this is nothing shy of phenomenal. And I know that you lost Frank in 2013, and you made the choice to keep going forward, and you chose life yeah. as hard as it was. And I'm saying those words, Sandy, but I can't even imagine. I've not been in your shoes. And you get a phone call in 2017. Can you tell us about that? Here I was minding my own business, <laughs> and... Um, I took a phone call from a retired firefighter who said, Sandy, we need your help. I want to know if you will go to Austin and speak on the Senate floor against this bill that is going to harm Houston firefighters, retirees, widows, and their beneficiaries. And. I talked to him for a few minutes. I don't know this gentleman, and I hung up the phone. I said, I'll get back to you, and, and my first thought was, I can't do that. My career was in sales. I don't do politics. I don't know about the Senate floor, and he persisted a little and reached back out to me again, and then I just remember thinking, you know what? I think this might be a loving gesture to Frank's memory, to fight for the benefits that he worked so hard for, I'm in. So this was Senate Bill 2190, and it did pass in 2017. Can you tell us how it's affected the firefighters, the, the ones that are active and the retirees? I have seen in the last few years since 2017 the magnitude of harm that that bill has done 
to Houston firefighters, both actives and retirees. And part of that harm is that many have lost hope, hope in politicians to do the right thing, hope in politicians to look at the whole story. And I have just been someone who's been able to capture and see for myself the devastation that this one bill has done. I can give you the numbers and tell you last year, the Houston Fire Department lost over 500 firefighters. They quit, they took early retirement, or they went elsewhere where they would be paid fairly. Oh my goodness. Where they could provide for their families, whether their benefits were better, whether they didn't have to go to work wondering what else was gonna be taken from them. I've heard their stories, I've seen their faces. There's a lot of pain. Okay, so what did you decide to do when the bill passed and you came home from Austin? I recognized that there were a lot of depressed firefighters and they were hurting. And uh, I said, what can I do? And I said, well, I love to bake, so I'm just gonna make cookies and then I'll take them to all the stations. How many stations is that? 97, okay. I think, at the time. Okay. And so we started the summer of 2017. You started taking cookies to 97 firehouses. With a handwritten thank you card. Okay. And I know your sole motivation was to encourage these people. Tell us about what happened that first year. I was in sales and Frank did his job and, and he didn't bring his job home. So I didn't need to go to fire stations. And so here I am, I'm about to embark on this, what would become the beginning of a journey, and just walk into a firehouse and hand them some cookies and a thank you card and shake their hands and tell them thank you for what you do. Year one, I start hearing stories about how my husband impacted others. And so year two, we start out and I said, well, I, I'm still gonna encourage them I'm an encourager, I'm always gonna do that. But I'm gonna take a message from their union president, thanking them for their hard work, reminding them that there are people fighting for them. And I was lucky and I got to hear some more stuff about my husband. I just never got tired of hearing kind things about him. It was like a way that you could actually stay connected with Frank. Mm -hmm. Just get to know him on a different level. Exactly. That's a huge gift. I didn't live in that world, and I was starting to get a glimpse of how really remarkable this one man was. And so year three rolls around, and I start my first delivery day, and everybody's smiling and happy, and I'm encouraging and everything, and now I'm walking to my car, and I turn around, and there's a firefighter standing there in trouble. You could just look in his eyes and see? Absolutely, 100%. That's what I remember is his eyes. And I said, are you okay? And he said, no, ma'am, I'm not. And I said, is it all this? And I meant everything that they're experiencing. With the benefits and that bill and, okay. Directly tied to that bill. Mm -hmm. And I said, do you have a family member you can talk to? And he said, no, ma'am, I'm not close to my family. And I said, well, do you have a buddy or a best friend? And he said, yes, I have a couple. And I asked him what his name was, and I said, you just heard me tell you that I pray for y'all every morning. And he said, yes. And I said, so I'm gonna continue to do that, but you need to promise me that you're gonna talk to your buddy about what you're going through. And he said, yes, I will. And I remember pointing my finger at him, and I said, now you promised. And he said, yes. And so I walked away, I got in the car, I told my sister, write this name down next to the station. Mm -hmm but I could not get this young firefighter out of my head. So I made a call to a district chief who was a friend of mine, and I relayed the story, and all I remember is him saying, I'm on it, and he hung up the phone. And you told him the firefighter was in trouble. And so he called me back within 24 hours, and he said, here's what's happened. I reached out to the senior, who reached out to the junior, who called him in and said, you know, you look like Something's bothering you, do you want to talk about it? Mm -hmm. And the firefighter did. And what I love about that captain 
is that he said, no matter if we're on shift or not, I'm here for you 24-7. And you can talk to me about anything. It doesn't have to be work-related. And my friend said, and this captain wanted me to tell you, thank you for caring about our firefighters. Thank you for taking notice and doing something. And he wants me to tell you that they're going to have their pulse on him, but he wanted me to tell you that that firefighter's going to be okay. How'd that make you feel? Relieved. Like I said, some of us get good at recognizing pain. Mm -hmm. His was just more evident, and I got to put eyes on him about three weeks ago. <laughs> and after I talked to them, part of my talk with them was about my experience year three. And he's standing there, and he has no idea I was talking about him. I crafted my words so that he didn't feel uncomfortable. And when it was over, he said, can I walk you out? And I have to admit my first reaction was, oh no, he knows. And I said, sure. So we walk out to the front of the station. He said, I want to tell you what happened the day after you were here. That was two years ago. And he told me a story and he said, it changed my life. So two years later, when you looked into his eyes, you weren't looking into the same eyes that you had seen before. And what you did, Sandy, is you took the deepest pain in your life and you kind of gave it to God and you allowed Him to bring you to a place of purpose to use that. And I, I would never be so bold to say that you saved that firefighter's life, but I think there's a pretty high probability that because you went there and you, you were available and you were encouraging and you baked 4,000 cookies or maybe it was 8,000 by that time um, and delivered a message of encouragement and love and hope to these firefighters, he was able to come to you and felt like you were safe for him to talk to. Right, a total stranger. I was a stranger to him 30 minutes before I'm walking out. Yeah. I told you I'd done some research on, on suicide, and one of the things that I discovered is that when you talk to somebody about it, that actually greatly reduces the chance of them committing suicide. It's like we don't want to open up this conversation. We don't want to say, oh, are you thinking about hurting yourself? Because we're afraid that that's going to just make it I don't know, maybe make it more real, um, more tangible, and possibly they would be more prone to do it. But it's exactly the opposite by, by initiating these conversations with people. And I think this is a really important concept for people to get because when I learned this, it was exactly the opposite of what I thought it would be. But by initiating these conversations, that's actually reducing the chance for somebody to take their own life. Well, and... Another reason that got us sitting across from each other is that it struck me that I was walking into every fire station and telling them that I wanted them to reach out and I wanted them to have a safe place for themselves, their words, their pain. And they had no idea that perhaps this woman who's bubbly, smiley, joyful, showing up with cookies could possibly know a level of pain that I'm talking about. That young firefighter, I felt, gave me permission to say, you know what, I'm gonna be bold and go out there irregardless of people's judgments mm -hmm. because that firefighter and any other person seeing this is worth it. There is a scripture verse in John, I think it's 12, 24, somewhere around there. And it's where Jesus is talking about the wheat that has to be planted in the soil. And I think he even uses the word dies so that more can live. And he was using that kind of as a metaphor about himself because he knew he was getting ready to go to the cross. And that's a principle that we see in nature. We plant something in the ground and then so much more grows from it. 
But I, I can't help but relate that to, to you and your situation because as, as horrible and traumatic as this whole ordeal has been with losing Frank, Sandy, because you trusted God and you didn't take matters into your own hands, there's been so much life that has sprung forth from his passing. And if you had have made a different choice, that wouldn't have happened. Correct me if I'm wrong, but, but when you're in that situation, in that pain that, that's blacker than black, you're being covered by that, that heavy, heavy weight, um, it's got to feel like it's hopeless because that's all that you can see right there in front of you. That's right. You, you can't see past that. But what I'd like to do is to, to let people know that even if you can't see it, it's there. Mm -hmm. And because of the choice that you made to continue with your life and then eventually to step out and to reach out and to, girlfriend, you got so far out of your comfort zone. I mean, you don't even know what a comfort zone is anymore. And, and to do all this, that God has just shined his light on that darkness and he's used it for such beauty to help other people. I was sitting in a fire station a few days ago and one of the guys on the ambulance comes in and he said, he sat down, we were all just talking and, and he said, you know what? I've been going through some personal stuff lately. And he said, and I just wanna tell you that when I opened the door and I saw that you were here, he said, I just saw this little ray of sunshine. And he said, and I want you to know that the work that you're doing matters. And I think at the core of everything, we all want to know that what we do matters. More importantly, that we matter. And I tell them all the time, if you let me continue coming into this house, I will continue baking cookies. And now we're over 12,000 cookies in. As long as you keep coming, let me come back here. I'm going to keep reminding you that you are important and you are valued and you are prayed for not to lose hope. Even when you can't see it, and I've said it's either at the surface or way down deep, don't stop looking for it. Because you don't know the plan that God has for your life. And you know, in the Bible, they... Jesus tells us that, that there's not going to be anything so great that he's, he won't provide a way out. I, I've been in this situation in my own life before where I was in such turmoil that I, I went through a series of steps. I, I couldn't resolve this issue that was going on in my life. And I'm, I'm reading my Bible. I'm, I'm praying. I'm just everything that I know to do and that's not working. I reach out to some friends, to some people that I thought were safe, and some of them were, but some of them turned out not to be so safe. And, you know, seeking accountability in this issue wasn't getting any resolution. I, I went to the church. I went to counseling in the church. It wasn't helping. And, and finally, it took going to a full-blown licensed therapist and I have to add, you need to go to the right therapist because mm -hmm. all therapists are not created equal. Right. Well, by the grace of God, this was the right therapist for me. And she did help me resolve the issues that were going on in my life. But, but the point is, just because something doesn't work, go to another level. Go somewhere else. You know, keep looking because there's a way to get out of it. I um, use the analogy of putting one step in front of the other because I know that there once was a time I couldn't even say that, let alone do it. Life is not always going to be sunshine. Um, I feel like I am better equipped with the tools that bring it on now. This has been a very, very heavy conversation, and we've talked a lot about pain and overcoming the pain, fighting your way through the pain, making a choice to keep going, but this pain has actually been a setup for a beautiful chapter of your life. Can you tell us the joy that you have received through what you've done? I wish I could express in words 
my gratitude to the men and women of the Houston Fire Department. I'm not sure I can do that adequately, but I think they know, and I try to convey that my visits. I want people to see joy after pain. I have had so much joy after this experience in my life, and that's what I choose to focus on every day. That's the hope that I want to leave with anybody watching this. Let's be kind. Let's listen. Let's show up. Let's hug somebody. Let's give them the freedom that they need at a time when they may need it most because you never know what somebody's going through. You hear that all the time. You just don't know. That's right. But I want to focus on the joy, the job that we've all been called to do. And I'm 100% convinced I've been called to do this work. That's joy. You just can't really measure how good something is until you have an understanding of how bad it could be. Sandy started this outreach that touches the entire Houston Fire Department, but knowing that she came from a place of such intense pain that at one point she felt like the only way to get rid of it was to take her own life. Knowing that just makes what she does now all the more beautiful. While we were getting ready for this interview, there was one thought that Sandy and I both kept coming back to, and that is, if this story can help just one person, then it's worth it. Let me ask you something. Are you that one? Are you feeling hopeless? Is there so much pain right now that you just don't know that you're ever gonna be able to get away from it? No matter how dark and how painful your life is right now, I'm here to tell you that there is hope. It's just that sometimes it's so hard that we can't see the hope and that's when we need to grab a hold of somebody and let them help us so we can get out of the dark. Please reach out to someone that you trust, a family member, a friend, a pastor. If you don't have anybody that you can call, then call the Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Their number is 800-273-8255. The voice telling you to take your own life, that's not a voice from God. That's from the thief who comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. But God has a purpose for your life and he has a plan for you. And if there's someone that you know who's going through a hard time, reach out to them. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for ages 10 to 34 and the fourth leading cause of death for ages 35 to 54. Just in the time that it takes to watch this video, about four people will have taken their own life in the United States. We're also including in the notes a book that's a great reference for anybody. It's by Dr. Matthew Sleeth and it's called Hope Always, How to Be a Force for Life in a culture of suicide. What we're talking about here is something where prevention is the only cure. Please take this seriously because someone's life could be on the line. Thank you so much for joining us.